a net. Father in heaven, we come before you this day, this time and place to say thanks. Likewise, Father, we come to you as unclean sinners. We gather today to fellowship with our fellow man. Father, may our fellowship be pleasing in your sight. May it be of benefit to each of us and aid in our spiritual growth. Father, we repent, asking that you forgive us for our transgressions. Help us, Father, to forgive our transgressors. And Father, we ask for forgiveness from anyone that we have transgressed against. We come asking for healing of this land. And Father, we take the ask you to take the stumbling blocks placed in our path by Satan and others and make them safe stepping stones. Father, we know you know and heard the many prayer requests, and we ask that you bless each one of them. Father, we also ask your blessing for the unspoken prayer request. Bless everyone that's on this worship line. Bless our families, bless our friends, and our enemies. So many of us are struggling with challenges, but Father, we know that you have the whole world in your hand. Father, we pray for all who are dealing with the many afflictions in the bodies and in the spirit and in the mind. Too many to name, Father. We are special acts for prayer as we deal with the challenges of our weak flesh. As we go further in this fellowship, please continue to guide us. Bless the teacher as your word come to us through him. Let us make, let it make our light brighter and bring us closer to you. And Father, when we step out of time into eternity, let it be into your loving arms. And we all say, Amen. 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 All right, guys. Uh, just a couple of things to remind you of this week. Uh, my friend Don, who uh, whose wife passed away suddenly in her 60s, if you could just remember him. Uh, as he's dealing with that loss, he is a believer, but he still needs to be uplifted in prayers and encouraged. Uh, my friend Rick is uh, meeting with him on a regular basis, but uh, we know the power of prayer. Everybody on this broadcast has experienced the power of prayer uh, as we pray for one another. So just mm -hmm. if you can remember Don and also Bill, Bill is uh, having some health struggles. He's not going to be with us. Today, uh, Bill's having to go through a, I guess, a treadmill a cardiac stress test today, which I'm sure he's not looking forward to. Uh, but uh, Bill's having some health difficulties. And if you could just remember Bill in your prayers, one of our uh, dedicated Breaking Bread persons. Uh, Donna won't be with us today. She said to say hello to everybody and Steve. Uh, also phoned in and said he was not going to be able to be with us today because he had a doctor's appointment that conflicted. So <clears throat> those are your prayer requests uh, that I have for this week. Um, now we're going to, I don't know if we'll get through all of John chapter four, go ahead and turn to John chapter 20, uh, John chapter four and go to verse 27, but just pause there for a second. There's two stories uh, if I have enough time, I'll go over both stories. If I don't have enough time, we'll do the next story next week. It's not a big deal. Um, but before we get started, I, I, I read this this weekend. My pastor was going through Romans 8, and this passage is quoted in Romans 8. And I just wanted to uh, kind of pull back from where we are right now and go to the 10,000 foot level. And if you know, we had this discussion the last couple of weeks about Jesus and Nicodemus. And, and Marty uh, asked a really good question uh, two or three weeks ago. You know, why did Nicodemus, Nicodemus struggle so? And then others, like on the day of Pentecost, willingly accept. And, and now we're knee deep in this story with the Samaritan woman. And we're going to see that after spending just a couple of minutes of, of with Jesus, her life is is turned upside down. 
she's greatly impacted by the Lord. Uh, Jesus, it took him like four swings at Nicodemus before he finally got through. So as we progress through the book of John, you're going to see this pattern repeated over and over again. And so I thought this, I just would spend a couple of minutes this morning um, giving you big picture. When you talk to people, sometimes the whole New Testament looks like it's a totally different story than the Old Testament. Like it's a completely different religion, Christianity from Judaism. Um, like we made something up and there just seems to be a disconnect and people will say, well, what about the Jews? You know, they still believe in the same God and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you something. And, and this is something that it affected Nicodemus. And as Jesus talked to other religious rulers throughout the rest of this book that we're reading, the Gospel of John, it's going to continue to be a stumbling block. They held so tightly to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament, to the law, that they weren't willing to open their eyes and see something new had come. Now, that's what it makes. It looks like our religion, something made up. But I want to assure you over and over again, and I picked just one passage to read you today, that their very scriptures, the very scriptures they would have been intimately familiar with, tell that the old way is going to pass away and a new way is coming. The old covenant's going to go away. There's going to be a new covenant. And they were told this in stories. They were told this in pictures. They were told this in prophecies. And today, I'm going to show you, they were told in black, in white, in their Hebrew Bible. So the stumbling block isn't that something new was created. This has always been the way it was going to be. The law and the Old Testament to pass away, the new covenant coming under Jesus Christ, and the Old Testament talks about it as plain as day. So the problem isn't that something new has been created, it's that the people wouldn't let go of their past and they clung to their religion and they clung because they didn't accept change. So what I'm going to read from is out of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, it's Jeremiah 31, it's just four short verses. And tell me if this isn't black and white, plain as day. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Was that confusing to anybody? Was that filled full of double entendres and metaphors and things that you had to dissect and really think about? Let me continue. Verse 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because here's why the old covenant is going away, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So you want to know why there was a need for the New Testament? Because we, not God, we didn't uphold our end of the bargain. Verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. So before that time, the law of the old covenant. After the time, here comes the new covenant. Here it is. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, if that isn't an incredibly clear, concise uh, and precise description of the new covenant of what Jesus is now on the scene in the gospel of John. He's standing in front of people. He's bringing this message. And to Marty's question, why 
didn't they know their own scriptures? Do you remember Jesus's interaction with Nicodemus? He was he expressed dismay. He said, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things. And so we get to John 3, 16. He had to spell it out for Nicodemus because he had these mental blocks, these barriers in his mind from culture and culture steeped in the culture, unwilling to change. But I want to assure you guys, as you process yourself through the New Testament, this is not something made up or any significant difference from what was described in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Their scriptures speak of this day coming in which we all live. So this is not anything new under the sun. So now we've had this conversation started. If you remember last week, Jesus comes. He, he doesn't bypass Samaria, where the despised Samaritans live, these half-breed Jews that they thought even less of than Gentiles. Jesus loves all people, so he's not going to bypass. He's going from Judea, Jerusalem. He's going up. He's going north. He's not going to take this big circuitous route like a Jew would typically do. He's going to cut right through Samaria. And the reason is he said he had to do it. Why? Because there's a woman. There's a woman at the well, and she's drawing water at an unusual time, at midday instead of early in the morning or late in the evening. And she's by herself. Why is she drawing water by herself in the middle of the day when nobody else is there? Because she's had multiple, multiple husbands and the man she's living with now isn't her husband. She's living in sin. So she's avoiding the townspeople. Jesus comes upon her and expresses kindness and love to her. Make no mistake. Last week, he called her out on her sins and confronted her with her sins, but did so in such a way that she didn't feel um, judged or threatened. She just was confronted with it and had to deal with it to see that she had a need for the Savior and he announced himself as the Messiah. Now, where were the disciples? If you remember the story from last week, they had been sent away to a neighboring village to get food. Now, Jesus was thirsty. This woman gave him water from the well because he had nothing to draw with. So his thirst has been satisfied, but he hasn't eaten in quite some time. So now the disciples come back. They come back on the scene. And there are two different scenes today, like a play. So the first scene is Jesus is finishing up his conversation with the woman and the disciples come back carrying their food. Verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot. This is an important point we'll come back to later. She left her water pot, went her way back to the city. Remember, the city was called Sikar, and said to the men there in her village, come, see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. So the first thing that we see on this scene is the disciples come. And they're shocked, they're amazed, they're marvel at the fact that he's not only talking to a woman, he's talking to, which is something they typically would not do in public, um, but she's talking to a single woman, not surrounded by other women, and she's a Samaritan woman, and as we soon find out from last week, she was a woman of questionable past. So... Jesus is stretching the limits of cultural propriety, and yet he did so out of love for this woman. But at the same time, the the disciples have walked with Christ long enough to know that he has a reason for what he's doing. So they didn't question him. Then this next part, the woman leaves the scene. She goes back to the city and she leaves her water pot. Now, let me ask you a question. This isn't like she's going out to get water to to, to water her basil plants in her garden or whatever. This was life sustaining for her. She would get water typically once or twice a day. This is to drink. This is to cook. This is to wash with. If you didn't have water, you died. Plain and simple. Droughts were very common back in the Middle East in those days. And so 
for her to leave her water pot says something. Something has happened to this woman that exceeds the value of her natural thirst. Her spiritual thirst has overwhelmed her natural thirst. She doesn't care one bit about her water pot right now. All she wants to do is run back into her city and tell people what she's just experienced. Can you see it? Now, it tells me one other interesting thing. She's coming back. You know, without your water pot, you will die. She will come back, but she's not going to come back alone. No spoiler alert there. She says to the men in her village, come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. So clearly Jesus so impressed this woman that I, I love this word because sometimes I use this um, where I just can't help myself and pray for a certain situation. She was compelled. She had been rocked to her core and she couldn't suppress herself. She had to tell those in her city that they need to come check out and meet this Jesus at the well. Now, keep in mind, these are the same people that treated her as an outcast. Now, Samaritans were already outcasts to the Jew. This woman was an outcast of the outcast. That's a pretty pretty big outcast. Did she let any of that phase her? Let me ask you a question. Do you ever hold a grudge? Are you, do you ever have stirrings or feelings of vindictiveness? Do you know how much this woman had? Zero. The only thing she cared about was telling these people who were previously mean to her, that you've got to come check us out. This, the, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? And she didn't care what they did to her before. So, and, and keep in mind, Jesus confronted her with her sin, but there was such an attraction. Um, there was such an impression that she didn't care. She was a changed woman now. I love this story. I relate far more to the Samaritan woman which she kind of is, a, I, I don't think the story and the sequence is accidental. I think it's very intentional, the way God orchestrated this. First, the meeting with Nicodemus, who was represented as a type of, a, of, a, of a, the utmost in humanity. He was religious upon religious. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the chief Pharisees. He was well-educated, well-spoken, and still he had a hole in his heart and needed Christ and Christ ministered to him in a different way than he did to the woman, but he still reached Nicodemus. And now on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have what we would call maybe the dregs of society, the outcast of the outcasts. And Jesus didn't care. He loved people one and all, and both of them were drawn to him, both of them were attracted to him. So that brings me to my first lesson. Almost everybody on this broadcast who watches live or on the recorded version on YouTube is a follower of Jesus Christ. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have your ultimate role model doing something right in front of you. I, I want us to always pattern ourselves after how Jesus treated these two people. Jesus displayed so much love and gave both Nicodemus and the woman at the well so much a sense of security that they felt safe with him. Even when their sin was exposed, Nicodemus was just stubborn pride. And the woman at the well, living with men, you know, she had some fleshly sexual sins going on. And it didn't matter. It's important for us as followers of Christ to give people, sinners, a safe place where they feel comfortable confessing their sin, repenting, and putting their trust in Christ just like we did. And the church, unfortunately, has gotten this completely upside down and backwards through a large part of its history. 
We judge people, we condemn lifestyles, and in the, in the same way, we condemn the people along with the lifestyles. Most of you are very familiar, and many of you have used the statement before, um, you know, hate the sin, but love the sinner. But that's a difficult, that is a very fine line to walk. It's very easy to cross over from hating the sin to where you hate the sinner. And all you have to do is look at the media and look at uh, social media and public opinion and listen, sinners will always be around us until Jesus comes. They is us. And I want to emphasize it. They are us. They're just in a different place right now than you are. But they, at one time you were. So you're not high and mighty. And we're not to look down on anybody. And we're to love them and give them a place where they feel like they're not condemned and not judged. Because as I taught last week and the week before, Jesus clearly said, I didn't come here to judge. I came here to save the lost. Now, Jesus will return one day to judge at his second coming. But that time is not now. We are living the age of the church. We're to be like Christ. And that's why we're to love our enemy and to turn the cheek and pray for our enemies, as Ned did in the opening uh, prayer today. This is how we're supposed to approach the world. Not with a stick, condemning them for their sin, telling them they're going to burn in the fires of hell, which they will. Jesus never shied away from either one of these two people telling them what they needed to hear. But he did so in a way that was so full of love and so full of acceptance of the individual that they felt comfortable dealing with their sin, repenting of it, and turning their lives over to, to Jesus. All right. That's one application for today. Moving on. The woman says to her villagers, could this be the Christ? I love this. This woman spent what, 15 minutes with the Lord or less? If that was their entire dialogue that we read last week, it couldn't have been any more than 15 minutes. And look at the progression in 15 minutes. First, when she saw him at the well, he was a Jew. What is a Jew speaking to a Samaritan woman? He was a Jew. And then later when Jesus showed her kindness, she called him sir. So we went from Jew to sir. She's showing him respect now. And then when he tells her about her life and her sin, she then calls him a prophet. So he's gone from a Jew to sir to prophet. And now she calls him the Christ. What a phenomenal progression. And it's really not atypical. It's pretty Pretty normal for this is what people start hearing about Jesus. They know about him intellectually, read something about him in a book, and then they begin to experience him through you guys in a more personal way. And now they're treating him with respect instead of just as a fact. And then they, the Holy Spirit starts to pull on him. And maybe there's some things done in their life that the Holy Spirit speaks to them. And, and suddenly he's more than just a fact. And then at one point they cross over and understand that he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, their savior. So the people of the city heard the woman and these Samaritans of the citizens of Sikar, they leave the city and they start walking towards Christ. And this is important. There was a distance there between Jacob's well and where this town was located at, possibly a, a, a big open field where uh, they would normally plant. And the people are walking from the city towards the well as a big crowd, like a mass of people with this woman right in the middle of them. Um, one of the things before I leave this and we go to verse 31 and 34 is I want you to note something. Sometimes we get hung up on witnessing to people. Why well, don't what happens if they ask me hard questions? I'm no, uh, I, I'm no, I'm no scholar. I don't know this stuff. Uh, I don't, I don't have my Bible memorized. What, 
what will I do? Notice that this woman, used of God, had a sweet, short, sweet, simple, yet effective testimony. She just told her story. People, that's all we need to do. Tell what God did for you. How is anybody going to argue a theological point on that? When they see the difference it made in your life, they will be attracted and curious and drawn to see what's going on. That's human nature. So you don't need to know all the order of the books of the Bible, and you don't need to just tell your story of a changed life. This woman was the same woman that was avoiding everybody in her village by going to the well in the middle of the day when nobody else would be there. And now she's drawing a crowd telling them about Jesus. You want to see a changed life. That's a changed life. And it's infectious. And the people hearing it, could, they know who she is. They couldn't help but see what has happened here to this woman. Can you see it? Can you feel it? I love this story. All right, go to verse 31. In the meantime, okay, we're back from the city. We're back at the well. We're back with Jesus and the disciples. Scene change again. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, his disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him food to eat? They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. He was speaking metaphorically. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So remember, the disciple, uh, that was their purpose. They went away to, uh, to a village to get food, to bring it back for them and, and the Lord to eat. And so they wanted Jesus to eat because obviously he had not eaten in a while. Now, Jesus is not saying with this statement that food and drink and rest are not important. Do not read that into the story. He's just saying that in terms of priorities, he wanted his, he's going to do a lesson now for his disciples. He's going to teach them now. He wanted his disciples to know that life was more than those natural things that our body needs. He was literally saying, man does not live by bread alone. Where have you heard that one before? Okay. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus is saying, listen, guys, take note. I've got a greater source of strength and satisfaction than the food that we eat. Um, I want you guys to know this same true satisfaction that I have. And if you want it, here's the key. Do the will of God the Father. Now, one sidebar note that I'd like to point out something. To me, you could just gloss that over and you, yeah, yeah, okay, I've heard that before. Do the will of God the Father. Okay, I get it. That's what I try to do. Please note this. Jesus did not say, he did not say his focus was the work. He didn't say his focus was the need. His focus wasn't the strategy. His focus wasn't the techniques. His focus wasn't even the needy soul that was sitting in front of him 15 minutes ago with the Samaritan woman. What did he say? His focus, the whole reason for his existence uh, was to do the will of God, the father. That was first and foremost to Christ, to do the will of God, the father. Now, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, all co-equal, all part of the triune God. But Jesus took the form of a human being and submitted himself to the will of the Father to do what needed to be done, which is to build a bridge so that we could have access to God. A new covenant is coming, a new way. Now, that brings me to my next application for us this week. If you look around, and most of you guys have been believers for a long time, if you look around at the experience of other fellow Christians, you can probably say there are countless, countless examples of others throughout the ages that have proved this exact point Jesus just made. There is nothing, there is nothing, there is nothing more satisfying than doing the work of God 
whatever that might be for that particular be believer. Now that's counterintuitive to your flesh. Um, and it's against our natural self, but it is nonetheless true. You will, uh, I wrote the happiest, most joyful place you will ever be is to be in the center of God's will. Nothing else compares. So, you know, our life, we spend chasing this and chasing that. And as we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, all you have to do is look at the rich and the famous in our culture and, and look at their addiction rates, look at their alcoholism rates, look at their suicide rates. They're typically equal, if not greater to, than the general population. What is going on? Because these things don't satisfy. Solomon wrote this in his book. They simply, it's like chasing the wind. The only thing that satisfies guys, just, just deal with it, learn it, and move on is to be in the center of God's will. And then Jesus said, and to finish his work. See, Jesus found satisfaction in not merely starting the work of God, but in finishing it. Now, I, I think it's interesting. The word he used here, finish, a uh, very similar word that he used in the Greek when he hung on the cross and he announced, it is finished. Similar word. So guys, before we go to break, I just want you to remember, we not only need to run the race well, but we need to finish it well also, okay? So that's the hard part. It's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and we're in this for the long haul. We wanna cross that line and we wanna finish the race strong. So when we come back, we will pick up in verses 35 through 38. We will finish the story today of the incident at the Samaritan village, the Samaritan city. Probably won't get to the next sign or miracle until next week, but if you could hop off and then hop back on, uh, we'll see how that goes. Try to be gone for only about 60 seconds, and I will see you back here in just a couple of minutes.